Njona pipikave matë nëzeta politike në planetin tërë në shtajvoni, me ose pa të drejt, statusi pa definuar politikë i këti ishulli, shumë shpesh është marë si krahasim për Kosovën, sigurisht që ka dalime. Dalimi mëjë madhës që Tajvani e ka këndështarë kinen, kurse ne e kemi Sërbin. Tajvani në njojnë shumë e pak shtetë si shtetë të pavarë, rrëdhë 16, kurse Kosovën më shumë se gjysë ma botës. Të dyat, Tajvani dhe Kosova janë aleat të shtetë bashkume të Amerikës, ndonë se Kosova për shtetëve të bashkurat të Amerikës njëhet si shtetë i pavarë, kurse Tajvani ju. Në raport me këtë ishull, i cili gjendët rrëdhë 160 km larkinës, Shebeo ndjek të ashtu quitër në doktrin ambiguiteti strategik. Tajvani për dalim nga Kosova është ndruar në një fuqi të rëndësishme ekonomike, po sa qërësht në fushën e teknologjis. Në këti shullë prodhohen shumica e të ashtu quajtërve semi-conductors, që janë mikroqipa që përdorin për shdo pajisje teknologjike pej kompjuterve deri të raketa që përdorin për luft. Sa për të ilustruar rëndësi në kësaj teknologjie, Shebeo para disa javesh i ka vu sankcion në kinës në këtë industri. Kina një fuqi e modha ekonomike, me gjitha të që ndrën në mbrapa në këtë drejtim, ma djethua që një pushtim eventual kinez është i motivuar për këtë qëllim. Sot në interviste kam një misafir të veçant, është Shih Chung Liu për facusit a i vonit për disa shtetet e rajonit, për fshia dhe Kosovën. Welcome, Mr. Shih, right? Liu, Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu, okay. Shih Chung is first name. Yes, last name is Liu. Yes. Uh, you have visited our country in last year's couple of times, right? Uh, this is my fifth visit to your beautiful country. Really? And do you find it beautiful? Well, the beauty comes not just from yeah. the, the scene or the landscape, but also from the people, yeah. you know. And uh, we often say that the most beautiful things from a country is the people's heart. Okay. So I, I found that um, the, the Taiwan and, the, and Kosovo share this one similar uh, uh, issue that is the people often are very nice, are very friendly, and but on the other hand, they are also very determined and they have uh, their own thinking mm -hmm. and they wanted to make their future a better one. So I do see that there are, there are plenty of room for, okay. for people from both countries to at least to get to know more each other. I said on my entrance here that there are many similarities between Taiwan and Kosovo. Surely there are differences. Yes. But in your opinion, uh, are we alike? Do we have similarities? What do you find? Definitely, definitely. Uh, back in 2008, when Kosovo first announced its independence, Taiwan was among some other countries that first recognized Kosovo's so independence. So when did Taiwan recognize Kosovo? Immediately? 2008. Yeah, immediately. Immediately, okay. you know. Um, why? You know, despite the long distance between Taiwan and Kosovo, why? Why Taiwan so was so interested about Kosovo's independence? Because Taiwan, like Kosovo, for decades, had been worked so hard to, to struggle you know, for international recognition. Yeah. Taiwan and Kosovo have worked so hard in the past few decades to try to expand our international space, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, in that regard, Kosovo is, is a bit luckier than Taiwan because there are more countries recognize Kosovo than Taiwan. How many Taiwan. countries recognize? So far, so far, at this moment, only 14 countries. Only 14? 14. 14. But you had, during the history, different uh, level of countries recognizing Yes. What was the highest? Uh... Oh, Taiwan uh, was the uh, UN members before 1971. So you can say that more than 100. So it's very interesting. Yes. Uh, I will refer to you as Mr. Ambassador. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting after 1948 when uh, Taiwan start developing international yes. relation because yes. uh, a lot of politicians, business people yes. escape from mainland yes. China. Yes. You were part, you were, you had a seat in uh, UN, in UN, not China. Yes. yes, because at that time, our government, Republic of China, represent the whole China. Okay. Back in, before 1940. But who were those people that established the government? Like people, because communists won against nationalists in China, right? The, uh, what we call the uh, Chinese Nationalist Party. Okay. And they had, they engaged in this civil war with the Chinese Communist Party. This happened in 
uh, from 1945 before on, 1945. Okay. Yes. So the uh, Nationalist Party was defeated by the Communist Party. So the Nationalist Party was forced to retreat to Taiwan. And how many people retreated? Oh, I'd say millions. Yes. Yeah. Millions, I, I, yes. I mean, according to my some knowledge, around two million escaped yes, millions, to Taiwan. Yes. And uh, because they were defeated, at that time, the, uh, the leader of the Nationalist Party was Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah. So, including my father, in fact. My father uh, is, was a mainlander. Okay. Uh, he was born and raised in Shandong province. I'm like a second generation of mainlander. Okay. Second generation. Because my mother was born and raised in Taiwan. So, okay. my father came with Chiang Kai-shek's group when he was 17. Just for the general public, so uh, most of the people in Taiwan ethnically are similar to the people to in the, yeah, mainland, mainland yes. China. Yes, yes. So you do not have problems with China regarding religion, you regarding ethnicity that are... Or culture. Or yeah. culture. Or language. Which yes. is common in Balkans because most of the conflicts yes. here yes. are regarding yes. background. Yes, this is a one major similarity between... Taiwan and Kosovo. When it comes to our individual national identity with the, the bigger, you know, neighboring country. Okay. Yes. So, uh, and then 1948, you you became part of UN, right? And it lasted until 1971. 1971. Yes. Yes. Because the Communist Party also claimed that because the, the Nationalist Party was withdrawn to Taiwan. But they still claim that they represent the whole China. But the Communist Party, who has already occupied the mainland China, claim that they have replaced the Nationalist Party. Okay. So in the United Nations, uh, the Communist China said that, okay, now the seats belong to them. Yeah. So they, and then of course, there were a lot of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, maneuvering. And then later on, um, the Communist Party won this United Nations campaign by acquiring a formal membership. But at that time, the, 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 uh, the Chinese Nationalist Party in Taiwan, they decided that they were going to retreat from the UN mm -hmm. because they don't want to uh, coexist okay. with a communist China. Because Nationalist Party in Taiwan, they claim they represent China. Yeah. So there's only one China. Yeah. They cannot allow two China. Yeah. So since 1971, Taiwan or Republic of China, Nationalist Party, they decided to withdraw from the United Nations. And at that time, the number of Taiwan or Republic of China's diplomatic allies, the numbers dropped fastly. So basically, before 1971, Taiwan was one of the countries. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, having diplomatic relation with most... Oh, yeah. More yeah. than 180 countries, I think. Yes. It, quite, it, it is quite <laughs> ironic because, uh, uh, according to my knowledge, it was Albania at the time, yes. the puppet country of <laughs> China, <laughs> yes. that invited China to become to yes. approve that, that yes. resolution. Yes. 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 That's yeah. true. That's yeah. true. So... It's quite ironic, yes. Yeah. Because at that time, uh, Republic of uh, Albania was a communist country, and the closest ally, actually, it was China. Yeah. But, but after 1971, uh, when Taiwan, Republic of China, uh, left the United Nations, it created some sort of a dom domino effect. So Japan cut official tie with Taiwan. And later on, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, uh, critical moments was 1979. The United States so also um, cut relation, official tie with Taiwan because the United States wants to establish official tie with China. So until 1979, U.S. recognized Taiwan as a country. No, they recognized China as a country. At, at what? Uh, until what date? 1979. Okay. Starting from 1979. Okay. Yes. What is the biggest spat that Taiwan has with China? So why? why you, you guys do not get along very well with each other, so... Because sovereignty. Okay. China, I mean, the current China claim that they own China. Taiwan is part of it. Mm -hmm. But the, the Nationalist Party in Taiwan, when they were still ruling party... In China? In, in, Taiwan, in Taiwan, in Taiwan, yeah. They claim that 
they were just temporarily resized, resided in Taiwan. Yeah. They want to go back and recover the whole China. So if China one day like democratizes itself and in China, let's say there are free elections, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would Taiwan uh, rejoin? So would you consider having again like free election and taking part in the election and in a de democratic society. Would Taiwan join China in a democratic China? It, it's up to Taiwanese people, 23 million Taiwanese people to decide yeah. in what way yeah. that Taiwan will, will rebuild its relationship with People's Republic of China. Assuming People's Republic of yeah. China has become a democratic country like Taiwan. Yeah. Something weird is going on in China recently. Oh, yes. uh, I read that there are demonstration. It's about COVID because in uh, yes. because of the huge restric restrictions in the past two years, yes. Yes. they are not immunized uh, people in the Republic yes. of China. Yes. So uh, international media are looking for troubles there. Yes. Um, uh, one month ago, the Chinese leader um, in the uh, in the Communist Chinese Party's uh, Party Congress uh, finally consolidated his power, and also he successfully lifted his term limits. Okay. For the Chinese leader in the past thirty years, uh, their terms is always uh, two terms. Yeah. So five years plus five After years. After Mao. After Mao and yeah. Jiang and yeah and also Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Yeah. But Xi Jinping has already. Uh, amended uh, the Chinese constitution by lifting this term limit. Yeah. And then through the party's endorsement, mm -hmm. now there's no term limit for him. Okay. So he's already entered into his third term and maybe perhaps the fourth term and fifth term. It does not look very lucky actually because the uh, economic pr prospect of China, yes. as I read, it was like for next year 2.8, which is uh, under the average of that part of Asia, like the average is around 5% economic yeah. development increase and China is 2.8, which is for a big country as China is quite a, a punch. You're right. Despite that, politically speaking, uh, Xi Jinping, China's leader, has successfully consolidated his power base. But the Chinese society is on the verge of a potential social unrest. Yeah. So this, uh, what we call A4, A4 paper revolution, you okay. just mentioned, uh, it started with uh, a fire, unfortunate fire incident in the city in Xinjiang province. Yeah. And then because of uh, the Chinese government continue to uphold this zero COVID case policies. Yeah. So the firemen was not allowed to get into the fire scenes and rescue all those people. So more than 10 people died in the fire. So that triggered uh, 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 unrest. Uh, unrest. So uh, I would say so far more than 50 cities, Chinese cities, people were took it to the street. Yeah. And But because still Chinese government uh, decided to up, uphold this uh, zero COVID cases. So they were not, they were illegally you know, on the street protest. So every one of them were holding this A4 white paper with no wording on that. Really? This is from the Soviet. Uh, it was very funny. I read, tragically funny actually, I read in the international media that TV station in China, when they are reporting about the world's uh, football tournament, yes. they are not showing the crowds because it will frustrate their own people seeing yeah, people without masks. Without masks. So they yes. are trying to give impression yes. that n nowhere in the world <laughs> there are people without masks. China is so far the only country in the world still, you know, uh, mandate people to wear masks mm -hmm. because they, the Chinese leader cannot allow uh, a sudden rise of uh, COVID cases in China, given the, the, the big size of its populations. Yeah. Yes. But covering those, those COVID cases is not a, a, a good strategy because what Taiwan's experience has shown in the past two years when it comes to COVID, uh, Taiwan government has uphold, upheld the, the principle of transparency. Uh, we established a command center. Uh, the command center uh, uh, organized a press conference every day telling Taiwanese people yeah. how many people got COVID today, how many people uh, unfortunately died, uh, and what kind of measures should the citizen abide by the governments. So the more transparent you are, 
and the more stability the society will be. Taiwan was, at that time, I remember in 2020, uh, was considered by international media as a good example yes. how to manage yes. the COVID. Yes. Yes. Uh, how many people died from COVID in Taiwan? So far? Yeah, so far. So far, I think it's about, about, about I think, um, I think less than, less than 30,000 people. Less than 30,000? Less than 30,000, yes. So around 1,000 and something uh, yes. per 1 million yes. inhabitants. 23 million people, huh? total, pop, total population, 23 yeah. million. Yes, yeah. like uh, less than 2,000 yes. per 1 million, which is much better than, let's say, than United States and United Kingdom. Yes. But you were right in the in the first in the early stage of the COVID, where um, you know um, most Taiwanese people uh, they don't get vaccine yet. Yeah. At that time, Taiwan has successfully managed the number of COVID. Every day, only like single digit. Yeah. With transparency, yeah. we are not hiding the numbers. Okay. Yeah. And that that was before vaccines. Yeah. You know. So at that time, Taiwan was able to maintain even for, for a consecutive six or eight, eight weeks, zero, zero daily uh, COVID cases. Yeah. China would like to portray their, themselves as a developed country, a like powerful country. But in the meantime, when it comes to vaccines, vaccines produced by China were quite weak. And weak. yeah, it didn't help a lot. Like it's no, different no. technology that we're using, but you know better from your perspective. Yes, yes. So that explains why a country like Taiwan or even U.S. they don't they don't want to, you know, uh, choose uh, the Chinese vaccine. You yeah. Know? So yeah, and in Taiwan also, most people we uh, we we took uh, uh, the the European the BNT or others, uh, you no know, American made uh, mRNA yeah, yes, uh, yes, style yes, of vaccines. Yes, yes. Would you explain for our people why China does not recognize Kosovo? So what is China's problem with Kosovo? <laughs> You know, when it comes to sovereignty issue, is always uh, a big, uh, a sensi a sensitive issue to China. You know, so uh, no way that China would recognize Taiwan or Xinjiang or, or Mongolia because they see that as a separate uh, uh, territory to them. Um, so when it comes to recognizing other countries' independence, sometimes uh, uh, China will have to think twice because they don't want people to relate that kind of uh, uh, recognition of uh, independence to Taiwan, mm -hmm. you know, so, but sometimes it put China in a, in a relatively uh, difficult, difficult position, you know, so, but, but again, when it comes to Taiwan, China always uphold this so-called one China principle. Oh, yeah, but it's, a, it, it is a commitment by China, yes. I think, from 1972. That's true that China will not push to unify with a war with Taiwan. So at that time, they agreed with the United States that it's China's ambition, uh, that Taiwan to become part of the China, but not using the force, or no, I'm wrong. No, 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 China has never renounced the use of force against Taiwan, okay. even up to the most recent Chinese Communist, Communist Party's Congress. Yeah. The Xi Jinping, Chinese leader, still said that China will use force against Taiwan if Taiwan pursues independence. Okay. But for the first time in last decades, it was a U.S. president like being literally emphasizing that uh, U.S. will protect Taiwan, will use force to protect Taiwan, yes. which was quite a bold sign yes. by U.S. administration. It's, uh, it has gone through nearly four decades evolution of policies, you know. I saw the book uh, you, you, on the bookshelf, the Kissingers. Yeah. I mean, back in 1972, when Kissinger accompanied Nixon, Richard yeah. Nixon, to visit Taiwan, to open door to, to, uh, to, China, to China, to China, sorry. And that time, uh, they signed a, uh, 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 some kind of a communique, it's called Shanghai Communique. Okay. In that communique, it's a China-US communique. It said clearly that the US acknowledge that there's only one China and okay. People's Republic of China represent this, this China okay. and Taiwan is part of it. But bear in mind, they use this diplomatic term, acknowledge, yeah. not recognize. Yeah. Okay, so simply it just said, okay, I, I'm, I'm Richard Nixon. 
I know what uh, the Chinese leader say about Taiwan. Chinese say that Taiwan is part of you and, uh, and you represent China. Okay, I'm, I'm American. I understand that. Yeah. But doesn't mean I recognize that or I accepted that. This is the source of what we say, uh, the strategic ambiguity. You just mentioned in the yeah. opening remarks. This is the strategic ambiguity that the- It's a policy by United States. Yeah, the United States have been enforcing in the past more than, more than 40, 40 years. Yeah. But as you say, things have uh, changed a little bit in the past couple of years because of the rise in China, because of Taiwan's democracy become more and more a uh, strategic asset to Washington and also semiconductor, as you mentioned we'll earlier. Talk later about yes, that. Yeah. yeah. So right now, this uh, this Washington version of a strategic ambiguity to Taiwan has become more and more of a strategically clarified. Yeah, it's not so what that, we said, that right much now, yes. ambiguity there. Yeah, a lot of people has repu re yeah. replaced this uh, strategic ambiguity with a strategic Clarity. Clarity, yes. Yeah. It was very interesting. It was quite tense a uh, few weeks ago when Nancy Pelosi, yes. a leader of majority uh, Democrats in House, she visited. She was quite blunt, even though China threatened harshly. Uh, how was she expected in Taiwan when she visited? Oh, we, Taiwan welcome all parliament members no matter they are from the US, Japan, or even Kosovo, yeah. or other European countries, Australia. We welcome all those uh, uh, senators and, and House representative party members to visit Taiwan. Nancy Pelosi was one of those uh, distinguished VIPs uh, to Taiwan. Um, but of course, Nancy Pelosi was former uh, House speaker. She was a political heavyweight, no doubt about yeah. it. And, but she has been very, very supportive of Taiwan democracy. So when she uh, expressed her uh, interest in visiting Taiwan, of course, we welcome her visit. But you know, did you feel threatened because threatened when, by, China? by China? Like because they were no, no, almost just... threatened because then they violated your airspace, China. After that visit, waters of Taiwan were vi violated. So at least increased the threat against you. China's uh, continued harassment on Taiwan uh, through penetrating into our air defense identification zone started way before Nancy Pelosi's okay. visit. But of course, like I said- It more, much more clear yeah, after that yeah, visit. Yes, yeah. Yeah. because Nancy Pelosi is uh, number three, you know, number three political heavyweight from, yeah. from the US. And, uh, but Nancy Pelosi, she's a fighter. She's a dem democracy yeah. fighter. Uh, the more harsh words that Chinese had on her or warn her not visiting Taiwan, or even threaten to shut her uh, charter flight down. Yeah. I mean, as a fighter, as a, as a, as a democracy fighter, uh, Nancy Pelosi still decided to visit Taiwan. It was quite brave. You know? And when she was in Taiwan, she was treated um, by our president, our, our, our government, and our people, because it was a manifestation of stronger U.S. support for Taiwan democracy. Yeah. But did people of Taiwan, even though like the tensions start increasing, would like U.S. heavyweights to visit Taiwan. So would they, would people of Taiwan take yes. the risk? Oh, yes. No matter yes. what? Yes. After Nancy Pelosi's visit, the Chinese side launched a series of military exercises yeah. along Taiwan's, the water surrounding Taiwan, even into uh, Japan's uh, economic zone. So Japanese government also protested China's yeah. uh, missile test. But in Taiwan, a lot of people from outsiders, uh, they feel that, wow, well, there's a tension going on uh, between Taiwan and China after Pelosi's visit. But in Taiwan society, most people um, tend to be very uh, calm. There was no panic. Not because uh, we, are, we, we, we don't feel any kind of military threat, but because people are used to it. People uh, are determined that um, we are democracy and uh, we treated our friends as, as, as they treated us so so well and China, the US has been very supportive of us. Yeah. So this is a, the way we treated our best friend and that has nothing to do with China. Yeah. You know? So when China launched this kind of a military threat on Taiwan, it will only be backfired by Taiwanese people. Yeah. You know? so, but there was no panic in Taiwan society. It is quite hard on my opinion to explain to people your relation with US. So 
in one hand, you are not recognized by U.S. Mm -hmm. In the other hand, uh, U.S. Army helps you a lot. So it is quite interesting <laughs> and big yes. with it. Yes, yes. All these dynamics between you and U.S. My question is, why is Taiwan important? Why is that? Because I don't think that 20 million people or 23 or yeah, it's a great nation. It's like a lot of people there, but I know many other cases in the world that are like, uh, people are suppressed even in larger number. So why is Taiwan important for US? Despite um, there's no official relationship between Taiwan and the United States now, ever since 1979, but Taiwan has earned through its own efforts, earned the US support by first, deepening Taiwan's democracy. Number two, by strengthening Taiwan's economy and, and technology. And number three, by, um, by, by turning Taiwan into a strategic asset mm -hmm. to, to the US. Now, Taiwan's position- So you imposed yourself. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's not gifted, it's, it's yeah. earned, it's okay. earned, you know. Um, later on, we will touch upon some of the Taiwan's uh, unique industry. Like, yeah, but, yes, yes. But, even from the strictly security point of view. I mean, from Trump administration to uh, the current Biden administration, the US government has seen Indo-Pacific as their, their grand security strategy in Asia. Yeah. And Taiwan, if you look at Indo-Pacific strategy, Taiwan stands right in the middle of it. Like Taiwan from China, yes. it is like 160 kilometers. Yes, yeah, straight. Yes, straight. Straight. Taiwan straight. So, yes. Uh, those waters between you and China yes. are international waters, international right? International waters, yeah. Yes. Which, which China tries to annihilate as a concept. China so, tries to turn the Taiwan Strait and Taiwan into its inner water. Yeah, yes. local waters. And so. that, will, that will not only challenge the U.S.'s first island chain, yeah. but also as an attempt to break through the second island chain. And you know first island chain starting from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Philippines. China tried, according to my knowledge, to change the uh, uh, nature of those waters by building, uh, manufacturing artificial uh, islands. That was the first time that happened that. In South China Sea, not in the South Taiwan Sea. Yeah, in South, South China Sea, yeah. yeah. Because China resorted to the historical claim, which the international uh, court has rejected. Yeah. Because China claimed that, historically speaking, the whole, they use this concept of nine dash line. Yeah. They draw this nine dash line uh, uh, on the uh, South China Sea yeah. and claim that within that nine dash line, yeah. all waters and, and islands belong to China. Okay. Can you tell me like, what, what would it be uh, or what it is the secret of Taiwan to become such a successful country, even though having like such a neighbor, giant, mammoth, like China, what did you do? Like how uh, you developed to become so successful? You know, Taiwan is relatively a young democracy. We opened yeah. up our democratization only in 1987. 1987. So, so it's only a little more than 30 years. Yeah. But just give you a, a number. According to the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit's annual survey, of Global Democracy Index 2022. Taiwan is ranked number eight in, among global democracies. Yeah. Like, the only Asian countries on top 10. In that club. Yes. I mean, your friends, it should be like maybe Scandinavian countries. Among 168 countries, Taiwan is number eight democracy. Democracy. The yeah. They, How they, you achieved, I mean, being such a young democracy, yes like not even 40 years democracy, to make such a giant steps, taking into account that democracy is threatened even in a consolidated countries, in Europe, some, in some places. So what, what's the receipt? I mean, what did you do? It was more of a bottom-up approach, uh, most of it from the civil society that came up with this kind of a change and then pressure the uh, authoritarian government in the past. Yeah. So the government decided to open up step by step the democratization in after 1987. But throughout, but it's not easy. Opening democracy doesn't mean you are 
already become a democracy. Yeah. You know, just so, a, yeah, it takes us. Uh, it takes both structural reform, constitutional reform, to change our political system, and also to revise our electoral system to make party competition a fair game, and also to lift up the bans on our our press to give our our press a hundred percent freedom of speech. So all in all. Civil society plus the government's uh, decision to open up, plus of course, U.S. support. So you were supported all the way by U.S. All the way by the U.S. But I would say that it's、uh, it's joined hand in hand. I mean, both domestic civil society and government's effort plus、uh, U.S. support. And also maybe it was like because you could you couldn't show a, a perfect example. To China, if you were not a democracy, so it's yes, quite yes, interesting yes. to mirror that.、So. And what makes Taiwan democracy so different, so unique, is、yeah. that、um, it was it has been evolved under a security, a constant security threat from a big neighbors. As I mentioned earlier, China has never renounced the use of force against Taiwan, and they see Taiwan's democracy as some kind of independence. You know, for example, back in 1996, China launched the first、uh, missile crisis in Taiwan Strait. Why? Because 1996. At, 1996. Because、yeah. at that time, Taiwan held the first ever democratically elected presidential election. Yeah, because there is speculation, Mr. Ambassador, that even fighting a war in Russia, Ukraine, Russia hates Ukraine not because of what they are, but because of the. They feel threatened by the democracy in Ukraine. Yes, yes. So yes, yes. Putin and his thugs, I mean, they they don't want to see such a big country in their doorstep to be a democracy. Is this? Yes, because the more Taiwan became a democratic country,、um, and also China is kind of returning to the more dictatorship、yeah. and authoritarian path, I think. It will kind of drift away Taiwan's people from the Chinese Communist Party.、Mm-hmm. So it also has something to do with national identity, change of national identity. Yeah. Just give you a number. Um, twenty years ago, if you ask Taiwanese people, um, do you identify yourself as Chinese or do you identify yourself as Taiwanese? Okay. I would say most people, I was more than sixty percent. Twenty years ago, said 20 that. Twenty years ago. Yes, I am. I kind of identify myself as as Chinese. Or Chinese and Taiwanese, but right now, 2022, if you ask Taiwanese people, I must say that at least nine out of ten will responded by, of course, I identify myself as Taiwanese, not Chinese. Really? Yes. Because there is a big debate even in Kosovo.、Uh, ethnically, we are Albanians. Yes. And there is a, a force. There is a trend of people. Uh, trying to identify themselves as Kosovars, so yes, and yes.、Uh, it is a debate. Some people are saying you cannot change it. So, but you are、uh, quite interesting example. So、yes. a new identity. Yes, yes, yeah. Because what I think this identity about Taiwan、uh, also was the result of China's more,、uh, you know, aggressive and belligerent. Attitude toward Taiwan. China constantly threatened they are going to take over Taiwan, and China has been blocking Taiwan's international participation.、Yeah. And China has been urging other countries to not help in Taiwan. You know, so and that Taiwanese people feel that yes, we are culturally the same. We have we share the cultural origins, religious、uh, origins, and how come you treat the, the Chinese Communist Party treated Taiwan so bad? You know, so、uh, especially among younger Taiwanese, you know, they were born when they were born. Taiwan has already become a, a democracy. Democracy, yeah, you know? liberal country. And they, they, of course, they identify themselves as Taiwanese. They don't know about this history between Chinese Communist Party and this civil war between Chinese Communist Party and Chinese Nationalist Party. The minute they were born, as long as they they they, they know. Uh, uh, their 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 family and also their chi-、uh, their country. They know that Taiwan, their country they live is an independent country. Yeah, they love to work in China because a、uh, better job, or they want to study in Beijing and Shanghai for master PhD. But when it comes to national identity, 
Taiwan is Taiwan. So China Taiwanese is Taiwan. people, they travel to China. Oh, yes. Yes. So and they, there are a lot of Taiwanese uh, businessmen that are working in China, really? investment in China. Does Chinese businessmen come to Taiwan? Um, no, no. Because of national security concerns. Oh, it's just one way. Uh, so for China, one, it's not a problem. Mostly one way. Okay. Mostly one for China, way. it's not a problem. Business people to go to Beijing, to work there, to study their students. So you, let's say, as a Taiwanese, or let's put it this way, you as a diplomat, uh, would you go, uh, are you allowed to go to China? Uh, no, no. So diplomats, no. people that are dealing with <laughs> politics, they are not allowed to go there. Well, they are. They would are, they arrest you? Because, uh, well, it depends on, uh, because I'm politically appointee. I'm, yeah. not a, I'm not a career diplomat. Okay. But, uh, of course, our law requires that um, for an ambassador who retires, of course, after several years, he or she is allowed to travel to China. You know, is allowed. Yes, is okay. allowed. Yes, yes. But because I'm political appointee, I don't, I don't, I don't like China. I don't want to go to China. Okay. It was very interesting because the whole world was watching what is going to happen to Hong Kong, who maintained a, like a, a, a different status, like it was under UK. It was democracy for 99 years, right? And then people were waiting with curiosity what China will do there. So uh, some people say that Taiwanese people, when they saw what happened with democracy in Hong Kong, it was like a good example that maybe falling under China is not a good way. No, that model of one country, two system failed, right? Failed, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, the Chinese government has never renounce the, uh, this unification campaign on Taiwan. They always said that uh, they are going to pursue unification. Um, and they use China, uh, Hong Kong as a, some kind of a platform right. or, or, or formula. Yeah. So they invented this so-called one country, two system on Hong Kong, saying guarantee that Hong Kong's people will get certain degrees of autonomy, yeah. right? Are they having that autonomy in Hong Kong? No. See how the Hong Kong press was uh, sabotaged yeah. by the Chinese, right? Yeah. And uh, several years ago, there was uh, um, some uh, 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 protest. Uh, some people called it the Umbrella yeah. uh, Revolution. Some young uh, Hong Kong students and also some uh, middle class people, they took it to the streets and protesting the, the violation of the Chinese government on this, uh, on this promise, yeah. one country, two system promise. But it was uh, it was cracked down by yeah. the Chinese, you know. And then right now, nobody talk about one country, two system now. Yeah. So in Taiwan, Taiwanese people have been watching the lessons mm -hmm. from Hong Kong. Okay. You know, so far, again, there's no market in Taiwan when it comes to one country, two system. Is there political parties in Taiwan that are pro-China? Oh, yes, yes. Taiwan is a democratic society. Do they have a impact in society, like no, the pro-China. Really, really. We allow they have this, do, do they have seats in Taiwan? In, no, uh, no, no, uh, no. Uh, right now in Taiwan, there are more than 100 registered political parties. Because this is, political yeah, party. this, is, this is freedom of yeah. uh, association, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as they are legitimately registered as a party, you know. There are also smaller political party in Taiwan that advocate unification. Yeah. But they don't have a, a seat or represent, representation. How many seats our... has your parliament? You are like parliamentary democracy, right? Yes. We have only one parliament uh, with one uh, 125 seats. 120? Yeah. Oh, not, simil not too many. Yeah. Similar li like us. We have yes, 120. Yes, yes. So you have a president elected by parliament or president elected no, president by the people? president directly elected by the, the people. Okay. Yes. How about media? Or media like... 100% uh, uh, freedom of expression mm -hmm. and the media, yeah. So you are a diplomat in Budapest, in Hungary. Yes, yes. but I also cover Kosovo. You cover yes. Kosovo. How yes. many other countries you cover? I also cover four Western Balkan countries, including Kosovo, Serbia, Montenegro, and uh, Bosnia. Okay. So uh, the relation of Taiwan with Hungary, like you have offices, oh, yes. but yes, not embassies. Like. But not embassy, but we enjoy most uh, you know, diplomatic privilege. Okay. And... It, is there any EU country that recognizes Taiwan? Only one, Vatican. Oh, Vatican recognizes Vatican, Taiwan. The only European country recognized Taiwan. It was a spat, I think, last year between Lithuania yes. and China because Lithuania, Lithuania uh, recognized, uh, tried to open the embassy. Uh, yeah, not recognize, open a trade office in Taiwan. Yeah, which is similar to, almost similar to embassy. 
and China uh, yes. revenged, I mean, immediately. Yes, yes, yes. And the Slovenians still maintain official relationship with People's Republic of China. All they want is to open up a trade office in Taiwan. Okay. Yes, but of course the Chinese wouldn't allow them to do so. But in fact, you mentioned Hungary. In fact, almost every European country, almost, they all have trade office or representative office in Taiwan. You know, so oh, they have offices. Oh, there. yes, yes. Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, UK, France, Germany, they all have office in Taiwan. Perfor so, performing yeah. some kind of diplomatic duties. Okay. Yes. And uh, do we have a relations? Like, like, are you open, like Taiwan, to open an office in Kosovo and to let Kosovo open an office in Taiwan? Uh, no, no. So far, there's no office on both sides. But we need to build up the momentum. Of course, um, like I said earlier, um, Balkans uh, is like an uncharted territory to most Taiwanese people. Yeah. My, my main mission is, to, is number one, to, to tell more story about Taiwan to the Kosovo people, mm -hmm. about how, how similar we are in this historical path, yeah. how determined we are to defend our sovereignty and our national security, especially when facing external threat, how, how desperate we want uh, more international recognition. Yeah. You know, we will share all these three uh, main similarities. So, in fact, it's, it's easier for Kosovo people to understand Taiwan and vice versa. Yeah. It makes no sense that, you know, I often joke that because I wanted to, uh, to bring some uh, Taiwanese investor to Kosovo because I have done a lot of start studies about Kosovo, you know, and also Albania. I think this is a, the market is, is pretty big. Yeah. You know, and also Kosovo and, and Albania can be used by Taiwanese uh, businessmen as a as a hub yeah. to EU market or to okay. Turkey or to Northern Africa. Yeah. You know, but when I bring bring up the uh, the concept of Kosovo as a potential market to Taiwanese people, sometimes people those big big you know, rich people they, their response was like Kosovo isn't the country still at war. You know, really? they still have this stereotype, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it, it, it shows that there's still a huge lack of understanding among Taiwanese people about Kosovo or about the bigger uh, Balkan. Okay. So, but there is an opportunity, like, because now we are in a, it looks like we are in a kind of a final stage of a dialogue with Serbia. Everybody is expecting that maybe by the spring, there will be an agreement with Serbia, like, to normalize the relation, yeah. if not recognition, I mean, to stabilize the uh, relation and to live in peace with each other without like any uh, uh, war yes, threat yes, yes. in the future. Is that opportunity still exists? Like uh, Taiwanese oh, business people to come to Kosovo? Definitely, definitely. If there's a, it's just, just, just like a lot of uh, foreign investors, they have their eyes on current Taiwan trade following Nancy Pelosi's visit. Yeah. They worry about whether there's going to be a war uh, between Taiwan and China in the next couple of months. Um, but of course, our, our, our intelligence and our analysis was that uh, the chances is, is, is very, very slight for immediate war. Yeah. No, no. But just like for businessmen, they always look at the political stability yeah. in this region. So for potential Taiwanese uh, investment in Kosovo or in, into Balkan, of course, stability and also government efficiencies and market potential and, uh, you know, workforce. The young and vibrant uh, workforce are all their concern, main concerns. So if peace can be forged um, between Kosovo and Serbia, and uh, relationship can be better between all Balkan countries, of course, um, it, will be, it, will, it will show uh, a, a good uh, opportunity for potential Taiwanese company to come to Kosovo and explore market uh, opportunities. All global media and economic experts they say that Taiwanese country, its leader on so-called semiconductors yes. that are microchips? Chip making, yes, chips. Chips, yes. yes. Uh, can you explain me a bit further? Like oh, yes. why yes. those semiconductors, which I explained in my entrance <laughs> here, <laughs> that even US now put some sanctions to Chinese not to let them use these uh, this, uh, yes. devices Whatever they are, yes. yes why? Yes. The, the, what is what is in it? For our Kosovo friend, okay. when you are using iPhone, yeah, or you are using Asus laptop, or Samsung, or you yeah. are driving, yeah, 
um, you need chips. Okay. okay. And uh, majority of, uh, of, of chips in those uh, the daily items you use are made by Taiwanese company. Really? You will be surprised to know that, right? Taiwanese company accounts for, I would say, Taiwan, Taiwan as a country accounts for nearly 60% of global chips. Making. So no phone, no, I read somewhere, ballistic uh, rockets. Yes, drones. Drones, yes. nothing yes. works without semiconductors. Yes. And in this industry, Taiwan has like you're saying, yes, yes. 60%. Yes. That's a, that was about an ordinary chip. Now we have advanced chip. Yeah. Like three nanometers or five nanometers. Yeah, it's very important, I think, to be yes. as little as possible. And, and Taiwanese company accounts for 90%, 90%. of advanced, innovative chips making. I read somewhere that there are around 60,000 people working in the biggest company that Taiwan has yes, on yes. semiconductors. Yes, yes. So all those people are native, like from Taiwan? Yes. But native, wow. Mostly native, yeah. Um, this company is called TSMC, Taiwan yeah, TSMC, yes, yeah. Semiconductor Corporation International. It has become um, a strategic player, even when it comes to uh, international security. Um, the, the U.S., the U.S. government has seen uh, TSMC as a, as a potential game changer, you know, because the future war is about, you know, competition over technology, yeah. Yeah. you know, and chips is, is the future. So it's not anymore manufacturing. That was China global leader on like assembling things in China. Many U.S. companies work yeah. there, assemble the products there. And More company like TSMC, they provide chips to iPhone, man manufacture in China mainly. But those are the lower, low end products. But when it comes to high end product like the rocket, the missile, you mentioned drones, those were, that requires advanced chips, like three nanometer, smaller one, smallest one. And those chips were made largely in Taiwan. Shkojna me një blok marketingu të dhe kthejmi pas pak. Jemi këty prap në intervjist me zotin Liu, i cili, si që thash, edhe në fillim të emisionit është ambasador i Republikës Taiwanit në Hungari, edhe i cili e mbulon me misionin e ti Kosovë në Serbi, në Bosnë dhe Malin e Zi. So, Mr. Liu, uh, you are uh, developing further this semiconductors. And uh, who are your rivals in this industry? Like, uh, like I say, um, for example, countries like TSMC yeah. and other Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's chip making company accounts for nearly 60% of global uh, semiconductor products. And uh, another, the second biggest chip making company is the Koreans, the Samsung. Samsung. Yeah. yeah, accounts for about 15 to 20%, you know. And now China wants to develop its own semiconductor industry because the Biden administration has enacted a chip law yeah. because Biden, they want to cut the uh, supply of chip material to the Chinese chip making company, you know. So this law will require all American engineering or, or Americans working for Chinese chip making company must, must quit their jobs and return to, to Washington, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, very acclaimed uh, New York Times journalist, Thomas Friedman. Yes. I remember reading him a few weeks ago. He was saying when U.S. sanctioned uh, China on this industry, he has gone that much further. He said this, this is the third world war, not what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. So yes. according to him, this is the most important single-handedly yes. event in the world. Yes. Um, uh, for, for our Kosovo uh, audience, uh, uh, a simple, simple question about chip making is that it, it separates two parts. One is the uh, material suppliers. The second one is the manufacturing. Taiwan is very good at manufacturing. Manufacturing. But, but Taiwan also has been teaming up with uh, uh, suppliers like uh, ASML, the Dutch company, okay. and also yeah. ma uh, applied material, the American company. Without supply of this uh, material and also without a strong you know, trust and working relationship between supplier and manufacturing company. None so of Taiwan's companies. Strengthen yeah. to very undisputed relation 
between Taiwan and U.S. Yes. If you have this gun in your hand, yes. so yes. it is yes. almost impossible yes. to see a breakup of relation with U.S. Yes, so that explains why the U.S. also want Taiwan's company TSMC to open up investment in Arizona. They did. You know? Oh, they did. Yes, and also by the administration, one of its uh, latest uh, diplomatic initiative is to establish what we call Chip Four. Chip Four. Okay. In new U.S., generation. U.S., Japan, Taiwan, and Korea. Oh, to to make like a joint venture. Chip Alliance. Wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, as a way to, you know, to counteract China's own uh, chip making industry. China is known in the world, like, uh, and especially in this case, even U.S. administration said that we are afraid of piratery from China. So oh, yes. they do a lot of piratery, yeah. like on all technology stuff. Yeah. How did you protect yourself? Because being such close with them. Oh, reputation. I mean, the reason why country like TSMC can earn a trust from those chip supplier, material suppliers, like AS, ASML or, or applied material, is because they believe Taiwan's, uh, uh, Taiwanese companies uh, is decent and, and uh, transparent. And that explains also why the Biden administration want to cut the supply from those uh, cheap material companies to China. Mm -hmm. Because like you say, China's reputation is not good. No. You know? So I think this is the most effective way to, uh, to shut down the Chinese government from becoming another challenger to yeah. the to the to the chip to the semiconductor um, supremacy yeah, yeah, of yeah. the United States because some analysts in U.S. are now kind of regretting yes. of the opportunity that U.S. gave to China with that 1971 yes. open policy to China that it was more like a revenge to Soviet Union because they wanted to create a rift yes. between two countries. And now they are saying we should not make the same mistakes two times. I just, uh, let me just show you one story. It's, it's open, it's uh, open information in the news. Recently, our president, Taiwan president, um, asked the, the founder of TSMC, Taiwanese uh, semiconductor uh, company, as uh, her special envoy to attend an Asia Pacific Economic Summit. You know, countries like US, Japan, China, and also others all wow. attended that. And this special envoy, the founder of TSMC, he, he told, when he returned to Taiwan, he told the uh, Taiwanese media saying that, wow, most, nation, most countries' leaders all approached him, asking him whether TSMC can open up new investment in wow. their countries. So, very, inter very interesting. Do you have contacts with our government here in Kosovo? Oh, well, we try to forge, uh, uh, you know, uh, very uh, institutionalized uh, dialogue channel with yours, not just your government, but also your society, your parliament. Like I said earlier, I wanted to share as many Taiwanese stories to the, Hong, to, to the uh, Kosovo people. Also, I also wanted to introduce Kosovo to Taiwan. Yeah. You know, I want to do it both ways. Okay. You know, so right now, uh, uh, the, I can, what I can share with you is that uh, Taiwan has offered, for example, a lot of scholarship for scholarship. Kosovo students. You have a good university there, Oh, right? yes. And also, uh, we come up with some program, training program, um, to invite Kosovo young and talented people to uh, to go to Taiwan. Or, but because in the past two years, you, due to the uh, COVID, uh, most of those programs were conducted in the, in the online way. So, and hopefully there will be more and more culture and uh, trade and uh, economic cooperation, agricultural cooperation in the future. But it takes two to tango. Yeah, but yeah. What, uh, <laughs> what are our dilemmas? I mean, Kosovo's institutions' dilemmas. No, Why? no, I, I, like I said, this is, uh, again, there, like I said earlier, there has been a huge lack of uh, understanding between our two sides. You know, so I think for democracy, I don't want to push uh, um, uh, your government too hard. I mean, I understand you have a lot of uh, issues to, to deal with now, but all I'm trying to say is, is telling the, uh, the uh, Kosovo audience that Taiwan is uh, not only a good player, but also a helpful player to Kosovo. Yeah. China is not, you know. And what, in what area can Taiwan uh, team up with Kosovo? As I mentioned earlier, educational, cultural, people-to-people -people engagement, trade, and potential investment from Taiwan. Yeah. Because Taiwanese businessmen, they are looking everywhere for alternative market. 
Right now, they have their eyes on some uh, Central and Eastern European country, like Hungary, that yeah. I work for. But I try to persuade them that, in fact, the Balkans is uh, not only an uncharted territory, but also has huge potentials, you know. And uh, especially when it comes to Kosovo, you have a young and very talented workforce. And uh, the, most of your young people speak excellent and fluent English. Yeah. And they have this international vision, you know. And uh, um, so, but, but like I said, it takes two to tango. Um, um, as long as more Taiwanese companies have the opportunity to visit Kosovo and explore market uh, opportunity, as long as your size can uh, explain to them, you know, why Kosovo is a, a tra is a potential market for Taiwanese people. Yeah. So I it mean, takes two to tango. Yeah, but I don't want to push you too much because you are in a visit in Kosovo and most probably you are contacting our institutions. But is there any degree of like, let's say first step of establishing relation well, I tend to see this relationship as, a, as an incremental one, okay. starting from building narrative, starting from telling story, starting from um, you know, building connections, you know, inviting people to visit each site. Yeah. You know? um, I understand that uh, both of our countries are facing um, some other um, 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 you know, elements of, uh, of intimidation, but, and also Taiwan and Kosovo all have its own priority, policy priority to deal with. But my mission, as I explained repeatedly, is to, to bring as many Taiwanese people to Kosovo, you know, yeah. and then have that engage with Kosovo people, you know, um, through, through education, through culture, through ICT training, through, you know, for example, hopefully next year, uh, my office can organize a, a, a trade delegation an ICT-based trade delegation to Kosovo okay. to explore potential market opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, a pra I'm a man of a pragmatism, you mm -hmm. know. I don't want to um, uh, just, just throw, uh, throw out uh, very uh, fancy uh, pictures. I'm, I, I want to do things uh, rationally and step-by-step, step, incrementally. I think former Prime Minister of Kosovo visit Taiwan, Abdullah Hote, in the past? Yes, yes, yes. As an MP. Yeah, again, this is something that I just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we need people on both sides to visit each other. Do we need visa to come there? Because we no, have this problem. Only, all you need to do is just fill in some kind of e, 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 e We visa. love countries yes, that yes, have yes, yes, visa yes, free for yes, Kosovo yes. because we are obsessed with EU still. Yes, Kosovo is a lost country yes, yes. having problems. Yes. With so as I say, um, I think it's very important for the first step, as you mentioned, first step. First step is to, to have people you know, get to know more about each other by visiting each other or by you know, sharing story, story with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Liu, uh, was on, no, honored to have you as a guest tonight. It's my honor. Yeah, thank you very much. She goes the room and make ambassador in the Republic of Taiwan in Hungary, Silian Bolana, the Kosovo and Serbian. Mali në zi, a ky është emisioni për sëtë, mos harojmë i falenderu partnerët e marketingut, është kafe Pavin, Espresso Pavin, e cila ofrohet në shumicën e restoranove në Prishtin, është Frutex, një pije fenomenale, është Birra Morea, edhe është një telefon nga kompania Gorenja, shimi në javën e ashme.